Welcome to Revitalize and Replant with Mark Clifton, where we equip pastors to take their churches from declining to thriving by pointing them to a new future and a new hope. Join us weekly for encouragement and practical advice in your pastoring journey. Hey, welcome to Revitalize and Replant. That's my radio voice, by the way, Kyle. Hey, <laughs> welcome. I used to be uh, a disc jockey, and um, my wife was not impressed with it, uh, and my, neither were my boys, so uh, they aren't impressed with the disc jockey voice. But anyway, uh, glad to have you here on the podcast. Mr. Kyle Beerman, yeah. give it up for Kyle it's Beerman. Exciting. This is the first time I've been on this side of the microphone it is. on this podcast. It is, That's Kyle. Fun. It's pretty cool. So we're glad Kyle is with us today. Uh, Mark Halleck has stepped out for a moment, and Dan Hurst is making a bunch of money someplace. So it's <laughs> Kyle and me today. But we're going to talk about worship music today, and basically we're going to answer this question, nine reasons why congregations don't sing like they yeah. used to. Yeah. You were a worship leader. Still I was. are a worship still, leader. Still am. Yeah, I lead worship for our youth ministry on Wednesday nights. There you go. Yeah. Absolutely. And it is an issue where sometimes the more music we have in church, the more, um, how shall we say it, the more uh, professional music, uh, the more produced music, yeah. the more worship team music, sometimes the less congregational singing. Yep. Sometimes as the music on the stage maybe gets more professional and more more produced, the less singing takes Ooh. place in the congregation. Ooh, Not that, always. No, but, but that's an interesting correlation that you bring up there, right? Yeah. That that might I, I don't know, that might that might play into it in some way. Yeah, huh. I, I would think so. The more complex the yeah. arrangements in, in music. Huh. You know, uh, we're looking today at an article, uh, a really good article that comes from uh, Kenny Lamb. And he does point out this really important, I think, topic, that prior to the Reformation, worship was largely done for the people. Mm. They sat and watched it and listened to it. However, uh, and music was performed by professional musicians who sang in an unfamiliar language, even Latin. However, the Reformation gave worship back to the people, which included congregational singing, which employed really simple, attainable tunes with solid scriptural lyrics in the language of the heart of the people. Worship, again, became something you participated in. Mm. And the evolution of the printed hymnal, man, it brought out an explosion of congregational singing all across the church. Later on, with the advent of video technologies, churches began to project lyrics on a screen. And uh, By the way, we used to use overheads. My first church plant, we used overheads. Yep. My first church I served as a worship leader, I would print off the yes. overheads. Yes, and you had to straighten them, make sure yeah, they yep. weren't crooked. Now, now, did you ever use the wrong kind of plastic and melt it yes, inside the copy machine? Yes, I have, the, I have done that the on, the over, uh, yes, on the copier <laughs> machine. I, I really have. Yes, yes, indeed. Anyway, we're going to talk today about, we've had all these different kind of movements in worship and, uh, you know, we talked about there, but at the end of the day, you want your congregation to sing yep. and oftentimes they're not. So Kyle, give us the nine reasons that, that uh, a friend, Brother Lamb here points out that people no longer sing like they used to. Yeah. So number one, and this is probably predictable, they don't know the songs. I'm sorry. I don't know that song. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I've never heard that song. I don't know the words to that song. And 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 sometimes, you know, the worship team, I mean, you listen to music all day long, right? I mean, you're listening to K-Love or whatever it is you listen to all day long, your favorite musicians on your on your uh, iTunes and stuff. Yep. And these songs really mean a lot to you. They really speak to your heart and you say, "Man, I can't wait to share this with my yeah. congregation." Well, they haven't they haven't marinated on it like you have. They haven't listened to it like you have. It, you're, it's the first time they see that. And I cannot tell you, Kyle, how many times I've been in a worship service where the worship team says, we're going to teach you a new song today. And it's like you just, you just, it's like you just suck all the air out of the room. Yeah. Who comes yeah. to church, Mr. Beer, Beer, Beerman, and says, man, I hope I get to learn a new song yeah, today. That's right. That's right. And, and look, this is not, we're not saying never sing a new song, right? Uh, okay, let me say, I'm not saying never sing a new song. All right. But sing them sparingly. Give your t give your people time to learn. Th there are good songs being written, but um, if you're introducing a new song every week and, and your people don't have time, as you said, to marinate, to learn the songs, 
um, they're not going to sing along because they don't know the words. Well, in our uh, normative size church, what we would do is sometimes during the uh, offertory or at other times, we would actually play the song we want them to learn with the lyrics and the yep. vocals, and they could hear it during the offertory. Yep. And they would maybe do that for two or three weeks, and so maybe the fourth week they're familiar with the words. If you're may, or you just let the worship team say, you know, for the next couple of Sundays, we're going to sing this song. You just listen, and then you invite yep. them. Because if you say, go to sing this with us, and they don't sing with you, I mean, it just, again, it, it sort of just lays an egg right it's, there. And, and it's, it's frustrating, both as a worship leader who has done this before, who has made this mistake, it's, and, and who has been on the other side of it in the congregation. It's frustrating on both sides. I, um, I was preaching in a large setting. I'm not going to tell you when. At one time. <laughs> <laughs> Once upon a time, yeah, I in an unspecified in, in place. In a large <laughs> setting, in an unspecified place. And it was not my church, and I was the guest, I was a guest preacher. And they had a guest music leader who really felt like he needed to sh- teach the congregation uh, a new song that he had written. Okay. And um, it was it was a it was a new song that that I mentioned he'd written it. And yes. so uh, the congregation was was pastors and their wives primarily. And we're talking maybe a thousand of them, all right? So we're not talking a small group. And they were there to be encouraged, uplifted, to worship. They needed something. What they did need was a new song taught to them. Mm. Now, I'm just telling you. So I'm st- I'm sitting there getting ready to go to preach. I'm supposed to preach as soon as he's done leading them in singing, but they're not really singing with him. He's trying to teach them a song. They're not really singing at all. They're kind of mumbling it. You know, They're not really into it, uh, but he's very into it. And he's very happy to be doing that. And so uh, when he gets done, um, I'm supposed to go preach. And um, I I just felt like under the leadership of the Holy Spirit that something needed to happen here. And so I I just simply said, uh, would you stand with me? And they stood, and I just simply did this. I just simply said, would you stand with me? And I just said, how marvelous. And that's all I said. Yep. And the whole congregation sang at the top of their lungs, how wonderful, and my song yeah. shall ever... They knew the song. They yeah. really did want to hear each other sing, yep. but they needed a, a song that they knew. Yep. They didn't even need a piano As, or a guitar. Or the words on the screen. Or the words on the screen. Because they knew it, yeah. And then when we got through with the chorus, they went right into, I stand amazed. And they sang... I'm thinking, guys, it's not that complicated. Yeah. Our people want to sing, but they want to sing songs they know. And so, yes, yeah. oftentimes the reason they don't sing is we're asking them to sing songs they don't know. Yep. Secondly, number two, we are singing songs not suitable for congregational singing. Say that again so the person we, on the stage <laughs> can hear you say it. Yeah, we are singing songs not suitable for congregational singing. And here's what this is getting at. Okay. Th- there are a lot of good songs that, that you will hear on the radio. Th- there are a lot of good songs um, it, that are being written by Christian artists. Fantastic songs, not congregational worship songs. Songs with odd bridges. Yes. and, and Odd one, rhythms, yes. odd Yes, and you keys. get to those strange yeah. bridges, and people are singing with you to a point, and then you get to that bridge, and then they quit singing because they don't know the bridge, and then they don't come back in. Or the, the rhythm changes, yep. or the key changes in some way. Or, <laughs> it's a good thing. I don't know how many worship people listen to this podcast. Probably very few after this. <laughs> or... It highlights the vocal or guitar talents of the leader, oh, yeah. And and oftentimes when the leader sings it in a way that is highlights his or her talent, nobody else can sing it like that. Yep. And so the, the congregation just kind of waits till he or she's done with that really impressive yep. part, and they go, "I guess it's for us again." Yep. It's not for you to show the giftedness that God's given you. That's not the point in leading the congregation to right. sing. Right. Absolutely. Kyle keeps looking at the screen because I keep touching I just, the microphone. No, I, I'm just I'm looking to keep an eye on the time. Yeah, I know, but I'm, I keep touching both. the microphone. So if you hear all this rambling, it's because I have to talk with my hands and I keep hitting the mic. Here's here's number three. We are singing in keys too high for the average singer. No doubt. 
No doubt. If, if you are singing a song by Shane and Shane in yes. the original Shane yes. and Shane key, yes. it is too high. In yes. fact, I, I was at a youth conference years ago that Shane and Shane were leading worship, and they yeah. apologized. Okay. Because they said, uh, Shane Bernard actually said, we apologize because the Lord gave us women's voices. Okay. All right. I like, I like Shane and I Shane. I do, too. I know? have for a long time. I really like Shane better than Shane, yeah. but they're both Don't tell good. Shane that, though. I won't Shane that. Well, that's a Shane. But seriously, I, I, I hear that all the time. You, you, they, they start singing a song, and you know that it's going to get to a, a place, a key. Uh, that yep. Normal people cannot sing. And trust me, when they have to drop out, they generally don't really come back in. Yep. They just quit. Yep. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Number four, the congregation can't hear the people around them singing. You know, I was last night, I was in uh, Kansas City last night with Jimbo Stewart on our team, and we drove by Warnow Road Baptist Church, where I had been pastor for a number of years, and uh, the church was open because there was some sort of an event going on in the fellowship hall, and I said, man, let's go and take a look at that, because Jimbo had never seen our church inside. So I walked in, and these people looked at me like, who are you and why are you here? <laughs> and I said, I used to be the pastor here. And they looked at me like, really? And I said, yeah, but it was a long time ago, which is kind of cool. The church has grown tremendously, yeah. and nobody even knows me, and I like that. But we walked in this church built in 1929, all right? I stand on the pulpit, and it's a church that seats 600 people. And uh, Jimbo stands at the back, and in a normal voice, I'm talking and he can hear every word I say wow. because it was made for acoustics, yep. all yep. right? wasn't made to look cool. wasn't made to look like a theater in Branson. It was made mm. to accommodate both public speaking and, listen to this, are you ready, congregational yeah. singing. So even when we only had 40 or 50 people in that building, you could hear each other sing. And I was in there a few months ago, and there was well over 200, 250 people singing and you could hear everything. It's so different when you're in a building that's a live building. Yep. Unfortunately, so many of the church buildings we build now are made for performance. Yep. So all the sound gets sucked into everything else, into the into the padded seats, into the walls, into the ceiling tiles or whatever. And we can't hear each other yeah. sing. Yeah. Um, now, this is a balance, all right? Because if the music is too loud, people may not sing along because they can't hear themselves. If the music is too quiet... They may not sing along either because they can't hear the music. So there's a balance here. There is. You got to have that right. I will yep. say this too, though. People don't play the piano as much as they used to. No, that's right. Kids used to grow up playing piano. Everybody. And I, and used... I say this as a guitarist. All right. Yeah. The piano is much more oh, suited to congregational that's where worship I'm at. than a guitar. That's where I'm yeah. headed. Yeah, yeah. One of the reasons people don't sing is you can't lead well with a guitar. You can do the rhythm. Yep. But but with a key, with a piano. You can you can play alto, soprano, tenor, bass. You got the rhythm. You 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 can you can you know when to make come louder and become softer. You can lead from a piano. You can't really lead from yeah. a guitar. Yep. And so many times I think, well, we just get a guitar up there. No, if you can get a keyboardist up there who really knows yeah. what they're doing, that is far far better. Yeah. So now, if all you got's a guitarist, then use them. The, use it. In fact, right. we we have um um. Our friend Nathan Drake, uh, who yep. has, runs Reawaken Hymns, has yep. compiled a hymnal of simplified um, guitar, uh, a simplified guitar hymnal. Took all the weird chords out, and uh, so if I mean, if, if you're just learning the guitar, you're trying to lead congregational worship. Do that to the best you can for the glory of God. But you're right; it's not the same as a it's keyboard. not the same. And also, in terms of the loudness of the music, if the instrumentation is so loud that the people can't hear themselves sing. Your instrumentation yep, is too loud. That's right. Because listen, one of the reasons we sing is obviously to glorify God, but we sing to encourage one another. Yep. So I want to sing these songs because maybe the person in front of me has been diagnosed with a stage four cancer that week, and they need to hear me singing yep. encourages them. Or I come in and perhaps I've got some real issues in my life, but I hear this elderly man behind me singing, and we sing to encourage one another. Yep. I mean, it's so important. Yep. Uh, number five, this, this goes along with that as well. We have created worship services, which are spectator events, yeah. building a performance environment. Some of this has to do, this can have, uh, this can be related to this, to the level of music, the, 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 um, volume level. Yep. So it can also be related to the amount of light that is on the congregation Versus the stage. I know. We, we have these things way, again, having the congregation in the dark and the, and the stage in the light 
basically says what's happening that really is important is on the stage. Yeah. And really what's happening is important is the congregation being yeah. there gathered to make much of Jesus together. And I say, turn up the lights. For goodness sake, turn up the lights. You know, we got, we got video screens now that ambient light does not bother them. Now, back in the early days right. of video projection, you kind of had to turn down the lights. Yep. But that is not the case anymore. You've got all kinds of flat screens and video screens and stuff like that where you can have plenty of ambient light in the, yep. in the, in the worship center and turn up the lights and let people see each other and let them sing to one another. And, and, and let absolutely. me say this. This is not just a, a curmudgeonly position. Here. Well, it is, actually. The, but, but, <laughs> but I think there's a theological foundation behind this because— sure. As, and you touched on it, Mark. What is important when the congregation gathers is the congregation gathering together, yeah. being together, yeah. experiencing the togetherness that happens as we obey Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Absolutely. And and you take away from some of that when you remove the communal aspect of congregational worship. Think about how much time we spend sitting in the dark. Yep. I mean... Both realistically, I mean, both in a real way, but in a figurative way. We sit alone in the dark. I mean, we're in our rooms in the dark. We're in our we're in our homes. We're on we're on our we're on our social media, staring at these phones. We're isolated constantly. Even on, and I spend I spend half my life on airplanes, right? And they're always full, right? But we're all nobody on that airplane, and you know, we don't all sit and visit and talk to each other right. for obvious reasons. But everybody's sort of in their own little world on that airplane. They're in their own little world in the airport. Everybody's in their own little world in their car. We, and, and so we need to come together as church and, and, and look at one another. And I got to see each other and I can't see you if it's dark. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Number six, the congregation. Yeah, did you get what I'm saying? Yes. All right. Absolutely. <laughs> Turn on the lights. <laughs> Number right. six, the congregation feels they are not expected to sing. Because they can't sing like the worship team does. Yes. Because I can't perform the way they do. You know, our friend uh, Joe Kreider says that the Holy Spirit is not... Uh, uh, does not require a good guitar lick to show up. I mean, he's, yep, you know, that's right. it, it, we think sometimes, in fact, sometimes almost the more impressive that the, the worship team becomes in their musical ability, the less we feel like we can join in. Yeah. It seems like it's above us. It's too, too complicated. Yep. Yep. Number seven, we fail to have a common body of hymnody. Okay. So here's the deal. I, I, I'm going to name drop here. You ready? All right. Okay. I love the name drop. All right. Um, uh, you 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 know somebody named named Keith Getty? You know, you know Keith, Keith Getty. I'm I'm yeah. familiar with the Gettys. Yeah, he's on my podcast a couple of times. Just you know, whatever. <laughs> uh, but when when Getty when when Keith, you know, me and Keith, we're, we're <laughs> Keith. like this. Uh, when Keith was on our podcast, he talked about his church, and I, and and he said maybe sixty is the total library of songs they sing at their church. Wow. And he said that may be more. Then and now, now, this is coming from a guy who's written more than yes, 60 yes, yes, worship yes, yes, songs. Yes. He said the <laughs> issue is you want them to become part of their heart. Mm. If you're singing 150 songs a year, they're not memorizing any of them. They're not recognizing them when they come back. Think about think about Hotel California. <laughs> I mean, as soon as that... Or think, think about, think if you're about, singing that in your church, you yeah, should email well, yeah, us. We, we need or, to have or, a or conversation. Think, think, think about Desperado, right? <laughs> Desperado, don't you come to your senses? I mean, as soon as it comes on, you go, why? Because when it was popular, it was played all the yeah. time. And, and so find 40 or 50 really solid theological songs that people can sing easily and lean into those and do not think yep. you've got to have this huge catalog of songs. Yeah, and he, uh, he mentions here, he says, in the old days, the hymnal was a repository of songs. Now, in the old days, meaning, I mean, we're talking like, at this point, I mean, the mid-90s. Well, <laughs> yeah, I would even well, say in the mid-90s. Mid I mean, yeah. you walked into any SBC that's church true. and you knew that there was going to be a Baptist hymnal Certainly in the, in the 80s. 80s. And, and you were going to use it. Certainly right? in the 80s, yeah, right. Um, so we're not, I mean, we're not talking but, 70, but 80 I grew, years I grew ago. up in church. And even, and we had the Broadman hymnal, 47 edition. We had yeah. the Baptist hymnal, 56 edition. We had all, we went clear up to the last one in 90 or 92, whatever. But in all the churches I grew up in, even though there would be 300 and some hymns in there, our churches always had a library sure. of about 50 or 60 yep. we sang. yep. 
And we used to have, on Sunday nights, my dad would lead music, and he would say, anybody have a special song you'd want to sing? And as a kid, I would always pick a song nobody had ever sung. We didn't know. <laughs> yep. And I would yell it out, and my dad would ignore me. Yeah. Anyway, that's another story. <laughs> but this is th- this is a change we've seen really in the last 20, 30 years. It's not a good change. That- it, because there was a time you went into any SBC church, you knew what curriculum they were using, you yeah. knew what songs they were going to sing, yeah. and and that's not the yeah. The, and I, the reason I say it's, it's not a not good change same. is that the hymnal was was a repository of some really good theology. Yeah. Now I'm not going to say every hymn in the <laughs> Baptist hymnal was absolutely solid, but we tried. All right, they, they tried. The, the editors of those hymnals tried. I was say they, that that's the difference. There were some editors who compiled, and they that. tried. And the thing was that that you could even buy your own hymnal or take your own hymnal home. Now, when I was at, at Warnell, um, what we did, we printed the songs in the worship guide every week. So we printed the, the words in the worship guide every single week. Y'all listening to this, you might want to try this. <laughs> Print the words to the songs in the worship guide. Why? Well, number one, if you have technology issues with your overhead, you don't have to worry about it. Or maybe you don't even use the overhead. Wow, how would that be? Yeah. We walk into church and we don't have to have a visual thing. I, I mean, know? I would say if you can, print the print the full music because at least well, your you folks can follow along, follow along. to... Even if they don't read music, they they can see yeah. the note goes up. There's a, the there's note a, goes down. Uh, that, look, yeah. we're really into it now because <laughs> when I was a kid, I took I took orchestra in high school in junior high school, right? So when we had a hymnal, I knew how to read the bass line. I played cello and bass. I knew how to read the bass line, so I could yeah. sing the bass line. I mean, you can't do that if you just got words. We've lost we've lost harmony in yeah. our churches. When I was a kid. People sang in harmony. But back to the hymnal, back to what we did at Warnell, because this is something you might want to do. We printed the words to every song we would sing every Sunday. And then we would say, take this program home with you, and this week, pray through these songs. Mm. Read a few lines of this song, and then thank God for the truth that applies, or ask him to apply the truth that doesn't, and then pray through the song. And then four weeks later, when we sing that song again, hopefully they prayed through it a few times. I mean, don't... It should be more than just up on a screen and then it disappears. Right. All right, right, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, last two, we'll go through. We'll go through these quickly. Worship leaders ad lib too much. Yes, do not ad lib. Do not ad lib. Do not ad lib. <laughs> do not ad lib. Do not ad lib. And honestly, you know, I'm not the first one to say this. In fact, I think Getty has said it. I know Joe Kreider has said it. You don't come out there and say how y'all feeling today. Yeah, because some of them aren't feeling good. And besides, what you're doing then, Kyle, is you're asking them to respond to you. And you don't want people to respond to you. You want people to respond to God. Yep. So you yep. open God's Word. You read God's Word. We sing God's Word. We respond to God. We don't respond to some worship leader who says, how y'all doing? Can y'all smile? You know, yep. hey, amen. Well, you can and, do better than that. I mean, it's not a pep rally, right. for goodness sake. And and here on the ad libbing as well, he's talking about straying from the melody, oh, that. doing trills <laughs> and well, no, I, I think you're onto something there as well. Okay, but, but you, typically, I mean, hopefully, you you have worship leaders with some degree of vocal talent and so, some degree of, of being able to sing that that's probably higher than the average congregant, yes. right? So, yes. so you, and you don't have to show off no, your vocal talents. No, don't, please. Because <laughs> as soon as you do that, they quit singing. Yep, that's right. All right. And here's the last one. Worship leaders are not connecting with the congregation. Here's the thing. You are not you 2 or George Strait. Right. You don't that's, hang out in right. your green room right. or your office. right. right. Man, get to know your Walk congregation. Walk among the people. Yes. Talk to them. Get to know them. Love them. Be out there with them. You're not a performer. Uh, you're a minister. Yeah. Absolutely right. And, and when you do that, you, you might get some feedback. Yeah, you and, might. Of, and, and it might not all be pleasant. And you need to hear it. And some reason you hang out in the green room because you don't want the feedback. Yes. Because you're going to sing what you like, and if they don't like it, that's mm. their problem. Yep, that's right. And that's a problem. Hey, check this out. We'll put it on the show notes. Yep. You can read this article, and then uh, any you can complain to us yeah. all you want. But we don't care as long as you subscribe. All right? So subscribe to our podcast. Check us out at churchreplanters.com. Thank you, Dr. Bierman. He is a doctor, by the way. Thank you, Dr. Bierman, for being with it's us good today. To be on. Thanks, man. We'll see you again soon. Bye. Thanks for joining us today on Revitalize and Replant. This podcast is brought to you by the North American Mission Board, where we help dying or struggling churches regain health for the glory of God and the good of their communities. If you found this conversation helpful, 
Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. To learn more about becoming a replanting pastor or to explore resources about revitalization for your own church, visit churchreplanters.com.